Well, I join all of my colleagues um, and all of you, I'm sure, for thanking Philip Brookman for this extraordinary event, show, catalog, and everybody else at the museum that made it possible for us to go on and have this occasion together. I'm very grateful to be here. I feel like um, the 40s, I, I feel like this investigation very deep into the 40s um, and Gordon Parks' work in the 40s is so crucial and we've been wanting it for so long. And so what a joy that it's happened. At 12.15 um, p.m. on a pleasant day in the early spring of 1943, in the heart of Midtown Manhattan, a piercing cry of Heil Hitler reverberated through the outdoor space of Rockefeller Center. It startled and set on edge a crowd of 2,000 people who had gathered there to attend the opening ceremonies of a new exhibition entitled The Nature of the Enemy. It was the second in a six-month series of six large outdoor exhibitions to be mounted by the Office of War Information. The Nature of the Enemy exhibition attempted to give the people of Manhattan a more vivid sense of what their lives would be like if Hitler and the Japanese were to win the war. The sounds of Hitler's voice and the roar of German responses to his speeches broadcast over the PA system from captured German sound films were only the initial shocks. Next came survivor's testimony. Authorities wheeled in John B. Powell, former editor of the China Weekly Review and the China Press in Shanghai, and set him in front of a huge paper mache tableau of a concentration camp. In what the New York Times reporter called measured and emotionless tones, Mr. Powell, a quote, maimed victim who had lost both of his feet in a Japanese internment camp, described the filthy and freezing cell in which he had been imprisoned. Mr. Powell concluded just before he was wheeled away with a sober injunction, let us not forget that the Japanese are still holding several thousands of our citizens in Shanghai, the Philippines, and elsewhere. Behind him, real barbed wire glinted in the tender sunlight. I'm interested in the nature of the enemy exhibition because I think it marks a kind of tiny corner but large turning point in the work for the FSA and OWI that Gordon Parks did. When he came to Washington, he came to a city mobilized for war. And he was, he needed to shift from the Chicago milieu and the, uh, uh, his own portrait practice, fashion practice, and um, artistic milieu to actually being trained by Roy Stryker and the FSA looking forward really to the OWI, to do work for the American government that would make preparedness for war and bring the community of Americans together on the home front now become a war front. It was very important that there be a black photographer. He was trained in order to be that person, to be able to bring black people into a unity behind the war effort when in fact the armed forces were segregated, Washington DC was segregated and black leaders were very, very hesitant um, that there should be a full bodied response of the black community to um, mobilization on the WV campaign, victory abroad and victory at home was um, um, very important at the time that uh, Gordon Parks was uh, moved to the OWI and the FSA and the OWI. And what I'm interested in here is a, a kind of thinking about from the evidence what it was meaning to him to photograph the nature of the enemy exhibition in Rockefeller Center in um, 1943. So these are Parks' photographs of the exhibition. You know Rockefeller Center, and this is these are the this is the central those central garden part in the in the middle of it, and, um, and that's a skating rink, I think. Um, and around it are uh, huge photographs of. Um, from the war in Europe, um, and then these floats, and then he he comes down, and and there are these kind of like it's I always think of it as like the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade floats. Um, it's extraordinary. So so you know the question is what are they thinking, and and what is what is Parks thinking um, as he's photographing this? 
Um, so, okay. So, um, the exhibition included six such tableaus as the uh, concentration camp, um, and each were uh, seen represented so-called the six planks of the enemy's platform. Um, there was the desecration of churches in Germany. The former minister to Norway, Mrs. Borden Harriman, stood in front of a display entitled The Militarization of Children, containing models of four huge goose-stepping rifle-toting children wearing gas masks. She told the public that even after the war against the Nazis was won, the struggle would be far from over. The United Nations, she said, would then have an even longer and tougher struggle uh, to neutralize the poison against almost 10 years of Nazi perversions, I'm quoting her, that have been planted in the minds of the children of Germany. Um, there was a huge mock-up of workers on the production line of an American armament factory, um, machine guns placed on a balcony above their heads, um, targeted each of the men, and um, it was clear that, quote, slavery would be the fate of American labor in the event of a Nazi victory. In front of a large-scale model of the New York Public Library, where books were being burned on the steps, Mrs. Eve Curry, an author or lecturer, it urged that every civilian and every soldier in the United Nations must know that if he wants his country to survive, he must beat those Nazi warriors. And finally, in front of a tableau entitled The Abolition of Justice, displayed an American citizen uh, with a shredded shirt and a flayed bloody back facing a judge who wore a Nazi uniform under his robes, um, and um, a, a justice, an American justice, condemned the mockery of justice practiced by the Axis governments. Such chilling language was precisely to the point. Elmer Davis, the director of the Office of War Information that had mounted the nature of the enemy exhibition, uh, in cooperation with Roy Stryker of the Farm Security Administration and the board of Rockefeller Center, explained that to the press that the central theme was, quote, the enemy plans this for you. He wanted to emphasize that Americans had to gain an absolutely clear and realistic understanding of what the enemy would do to all of us if we lost this war. Here is Parks um, photographing it, and I think that we can think that this is odd, these, the, the, I, the, the strategy of these floats is unusual as a way to teach the American public that there was an enemy, that we had an enemy, and what the enemy was going to do to us. Um, and um, its success, I think, is interesting to ponder, because um, how could such a display um, arranged in so heavily allegorical a setting possibly deepen the sense of the reality of the war? Is there not something fantastical about such a display? Does it not veer off into the region of theatricality in which the real is more, not less, difficult to conceive? Is the spectator not left with less rather than more clarity with what might be in store? Um, I want to propose, though, that it's precisely this quality of fantasy expressed in the six dioramas that made them effective when played off of the hyper-realism of the documentary photography that's around Poland, 1939, Belgium, 1940, Pearl Harbor, 1941, that are also displayed in the exhibition space. And the concentration camp tableau is a case in point. On this float, four large, perfectly solid and healthy, well-fed, well-groomed, well-dressed men are trapped in a barbed wire pen. One or two even seem to be wearing white shirts, slacks, and ties from the office. The pen is empty, save for some scraps of wood, indicating that they have little fuel to burn. But at the moment, they are suffering more from an inner chill than from the cold. They assume bodily stances and gaze out over the four sides of the barbed wire in ways that signify a variety of emotions. Uh, puzzlement, defiance, supplication, and defeat. This orderly scene, labeled concentration camps um, in large white letters on the side of the display, has absolutely nothing to do with the Nazi death camps that were operating at this precise moment as mechanized slaughterhouses. 
In fact, it is clearly designated as a Japanese camp rather than a German camp, both by the speaker who speaks about it and by the writing on the side of the platform, which um, inscribes a quote from Admiral Shigetaro Shimada, quote, the Japanese must make no scruples about eliminating from this sphere any element reluctant to conform to the will of the Japanese race, unquote. But not only does the caption um, uh, give this time space coordinate, the scene it designates also has little to do with the depth and violence of degradation and starvation and death in the Japanese camps. So how then is it accomplishing its effect? That is to say, there's nothing real here. So what is the effect? And yet, we know that the horrors of the Japanese camps were effectively conjured because the press reported that uh, the 2,000 people were clearly shaken by the testimony and impressed with this exhibition. Um, and what I think is happening is that the photographs that Gordon Parks took are showing um, the people becoming concerned as they take in this information. Um, in image after image, one sees drawn, serious faces of spectators standing alone or gathered in small groups, intent on pondering what is being shown. Um, in some photographs, the spectators are engaged in conversation among themselves, but the, ex the conversation always has this tableau as backdrop. The war is either the topic or it's behind you, but it's never absent. Overall, the exhibition in Gordon Parks' photograph stages a drama of approach and avoidance, paring down denial and preparing a frightened American public for war. Um, another way to say this is to say that the tableau work on the level of fantasy or desire, provoking both admiration, attraction, and repulsion. The scenes simultaneously occlude what they most fear in the act of making it visible and give form to those fears through a set of distortions that allow them on one some level to be apprehended. The strategy of watching the public take this in is interesting to me because it's exactly um, Gordon Parks's task at this time, and he moves from here to photograph um, the Tuskegee Airmen and to um, uh, embed himself in the military service. And I just want to read to you a fantasy of his own that he shares with us for, in a, a Choice of Weapons when he's contemplating having to make this switch from his peacetime work to becoming a officer of Office of War Information photographer. He writes about sitting, thinking, oh my, look what I did. I signed up for this. I'll have to leave my family. I might come I might not come back. What did I do? And there's a there's a scene in which he's sitting all night and rocking in a chair and thinking about this, and this is what he writes. And I sat there rocking myself into the imagined war zone, watching the black pilots roar off to meet the enemy. And I watched them return, tired, dusty, their planes riddled with bullets. And I sat listening to them all tell of battle, victory, and death. And I put the words in their mouths and took the kind of pictures that would go well above their words. Then suddenly the room was trembling from the strafing and bombing of our position by enemy planes, but somehow I survived this and got to England, and flying back across the channel in the bomber squadron, I braced my camera against the gun bay, and again I photographed the black pilots as they came in their P-38 wingtip to wingtip, and I motioned them in closer to my shots as they fell away and rose again around and above us as we roared over the targets, and then the flak was bouncing us all over the sky and someone cried, we're hit, we're hit, and we're going down, twisting, smoking, exploding, and then it was all over. I stopped rocking. The chair let out a tiny squeak as I pushed up from it, and I stood until it had rocked itself still. Then I picked up my bags and left the place forever. And through all of this, had, though all of this had taken place in my head, it had developed out of the sense of possibility. The moment I entered the office, I knew why Stryker had called me in. The laboratory technicians were giving me a going away party. Even the red haired lunchroom manager stopped to say goodbye, and all the doubts I had ha harbored were instantly replaced by the joy of this 
last hour. I think he's an extraordinary war photographer here, documenting for us what it means to approach and avoid and take in the idea that there, this is at, right after Pearl Harbor, that the American people have an enemy and um, we, the nature of the enemy is something that needs to be known to us both within ourselves and um, for the nation. We can have a further discussion about the politics of that, but the, what's happening here, I think, is an extraordinary documentation of that. Thank you.